Hi, I'm Eric Citrenbaum, and this is the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group's COVID Model Projections for February 4th, 2022. Uh, here's our intro slide. This is a list of contributors to the report. And uh, a reminder down here of who we are. We're an independent group of academics and affiliated individuals. Uh, we do data analysis and modeling of COVID-19 pandemic data in British Columbia and when necessary elsewhere uh, for you know broadening out our base of information. And our goal is to uh, build a better understanding of what's going on with the pandemic in British Columbia for the sake of public education and also for uh, hopefully informing decision making. All right, so overview of the report. Currently we're in the middle of our Omicron wave in British Columbia. In our previous report, we talked about the uh, the coming Omicron wave and its implications for our um, communities and hospitals. And um, we had difficulties with data. These have not gotten any better. We have substantial data gaps in British Columbia. And so a big theme of this report is, you know, what can we say even though we don't have a lot of good data? Um, so uh, there's uh, news of a new subvariant of Omicron, BA2. Uh, it's been found to spread quite rapidly in other jurisdictions. We haven't seen a lot of spread yet in Canada or in BC specifically, uh, but estimating from elsewhere, we find a selection coefficient of about 10% or 0.1 per day relative to BA1. So it's a significantly faster spreader according to the data that's available so far. Um, but we don't have genomic data in BC to measure that spread here. Uh, and so we can't really assess what it's doing or what it will be doing. Um, so case counts that we've been using for the last little while to understand, case counts among the age 70 plus groups uh, that we've been using for a little while, they've now plateaued in BC, uh, showing signs of decline in the Fraser Health uh, Authority, but not elsewhere in the province yet. And um, the number of individuals admitted to hospital and number of individuals hospitalized has leveled off. All right, so a few words about the data that we have or don't have available to us in BC. Uh, we've had a lot of difficulty with all data streams that are publicly available in BC that have been useful or ought to be useful for monitoring what's going on with the Omicron wave. Uh, so first off is case counts, which we've relied on heavily in the past for um, for fitting the model and gauging, uh, you know, projections. Um, so eligibility for testing has shifted repeatedly. No group is consistently monitored. Testing rates by age have plummeted for most age groups and rapid antigen, rapid antigen test data has not been made available. So we don't know anything about what that uh, source of testing is finding. Uh, hospitalization data so with the testing limitations, hospitalization data in principle should be a good alternative because um, admission to a hospital, conditions for admission to a hospital ought to be fairly consistent over time. Um, however, criteria for hospital admissions and occupancy are not always clear in BC and they differ among health authorities. Uh, criteria have shifted during the Omicron pandemic. Uh, including now more incidental cases, but testing less in hospitals. So wastewater data, there's some potential there for using um, that, that as a signal for uh, what's going on with infections. Um, but uh, monitoring is confined to the lower mainland. Publicly available data is not normalized by flow rate, which should be a standard. And data for non-COVID viruses, which is another way of normalizing data, um, is also not available in BC. Uh, genetic data, BA2 is replacing BA1 in many jurisdictions, but we're unable to see that in BC because the majority of BC data is not shared in a timely fashion. We may eventually be able to find out what happened in the past, but not what's happening currently. Um, virus sequencing also depends on testing. And as you know, we have problems with testing capacity right now, still in British Columbia. So keeping all these major data limitations in mind, uh, the rest of the report will, you know, attempt to do something with what we do have available to us. Um, 
and you know sort of figure out if we can project what's going on now and in the near future. The first slide here that I'm going to um, cover is talking about this BA2. So you see here uh, a full tree of um, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, starting off with the original um, virus from uh, from Wuhan. And you can see different branches that we've seen hit uh, British Columbia. For example, here's the Alpha variant, and here is the Delta variant, and now the Omicron. And you can see there's an early branch here in Omicron with BA1 branching off here, which is the um, the variant or the sublineage of Omicron that we're seeing predominantly in Canada and specifically in BC. And then here is the BA2, which is closely related but quite different still from BA1 and is not prevalent yet in uh, most of Canada. All right, so uh, the two of them differ at a number of sites, but they share 21 changes in the spike protein. BA2 is actually a relatively old lineage. It's branched off from what we're seeing uh, BA1 in BC um, possibly as much as a year ago. Um, it started to spread in several countries showing signs that it has gained a selective advantage over BA1 and um, that selective advantage we've estimated in analysis um, given in the appendix here which is around 11 percent per day uh, from the Dan Denmark data and about 15 percent per day from UK data. So in Canada we have very few BA2 sequences that have appeared on GISAID which is the uh, public repository for sequences, 58 in total. Um, BC has submitted 11 sequences, most of them from, uh, from you know, 2021 now, uh, making it impossible to tell what's happening with BA2 currently in BC. Test positivity. So, um, so you may have heard numbers uh, about test positivity. They're, they're likely a little bit different here. What we've done here is separate out just the public data. So the private data has uh, lower uh, test positivity. That's because it's um, it's you know includes a lot of things like film industry uh, testing, which is not based on uh, people being symptomatic. And so if you just look at the public data, this is from the surveillance dashboard. Um, and what you see, this is uh, collected by Rob Dumont. And what you see is a rise from pre-Omicron of, you know, in the range of 5% positivity and now up to in the range of 40% uh, positivity. And that's the case across the province. And um, this is uh, scraped from the BCCDC surveillance report and similar type of number, just shy of 35% here, while the private testing is quite a bit lower which is why some of the publicly announced numbers have been a kind of a, a combination of these two, generating a lower positivity than what I'm reporting here. Uh, okay, so this is interesting. Uh, a University of Maryland um, Facebook collaboration, they have a survey uh, running and they have, at least from BC, there's on the order of about 300 people that have participated in the survey. Do you know someone in your local community sick with fever or uh, either cough or difficulty breathing. And you can see here that about 40% of the population uh, or 35% of the population has uh, answered that yes. And that's a big rise from uh, pre-Omicron pre arrival. And you can see that that, that data, it, there's, it's noisy, it's the purple dots and this yellow is kind of a, a filtered version of that. And you can see that it's sort of, sort of plateaued. Um, and then other question have, uh, I believe this is, have you had fever along with a cough or difficulty breathing in the last 24 hours? And now that's at 4%. Now that could be uh, things aside from uh, COVID as well, um, but some gauge of um, the current prevalence, I guess. But you'll notice that the data is quite spread out and there is a slight decline here, but compared to the spread, that's probably not uh, significant. So we're looking at most likely some kind of a plateau near a peak maybe at this point. Okay, so we've, we've done this, uh, talked about this previously. Here are the age corrected case counts. Um, so what Sally, um, Sally Otto has been doing with this analysis, she's, um, she's looked at the case counts 
for different age groups. And because the individuals over 70 were still encouraged to get tested if they were showing symptoms, but the younger age cohorts were discouraged from doing so. Um, we've seen a rapid drop in testing in the other age cohorts, but the 70 plus group has been fairly uh, well constant or um, not, not a dramatic change uh, through the Omicron wave. And so, um, so let's take a look on the next slide here what that tells us. So what you see in green here is the positive case uh, counts for the 70 plus cohort, which we're going to assume here is a good sample of uh, what's going on in the 70 plus population. And what you see in blue is the, the positive case counts for the under 70 group, which looks to be in decline. And remember, this is on a log scale, so it's a little bit more dramatic if you look on a linear scale. But that decline is really most likely due to this rapid drop in testing. And so if you use the trajectory of the 70 plus and correct from early in December, you know, go forward with a correction based on the shape of the 70 plus group, we get um, a much higher estimate of cases, daily daily cases, uh, new daily cases in BC, which is about around 8,300. Um, and you'll notice the 70 plus age group, whether or not this translation, this correction is an accurate reflection of what's going on, um, at least in the 70 plus, which is a group that has, you know, a, a relatively high hospitalization rate compared to the other groups, and that is maybe plateauing, or maybe there's a slight decline in that group, but it is still at quite high levels. So one one comment I should make about um, what might be, you know, what might under, undermine this this analysis here is that um, the age distribution of infection may have shifted over the last month. Uh, it's possible that early on there were more people infected in the younger cohorts, and now that's moved. To the older or vice versa so in, no matter how it's shifted that would render this estimation method uh, inaccurate and this is what that age correction looks like across the health authorities so here is dean carlin's analysis of the omicron wave uh, across the U.S. states. This is just for California as a typical example. What you see here, he's fitting the data from hospital admissions. Um, and uh, you can see here, he's got two versions of the data. One is solid, which is the current fit up until the most recent data. But even if you go back a week or so and use the fit that he was using up until then and see what the projection looks like, that projection was fairly good. Now, why was he predicting this turnaround? There's two possible explanations for a turnaround. One is um, that they've reached uh, a herd immunity. In other words, there's enough immunity in the population that the virus has trouble spreading to, you know, from one person to more than one person. And so uh, it tails off. And the other possibility is that people have just spontaneously decided to change their behavior or they have measures put in place and that coordinates people's change in behavior. And that would lead to a more rapid turnaround. So the typical look of, uh, in, you know, the onset of of uh, herd immunity and a decline in cases because of of uh, infection-based immunity would be on a log plot. You would see that as exponential growth, which turns into a straight line on the log plot, and then a gradual bowing over and a return to a straight line on the way down. And what you see here is a far too rapid change in slope. It's really abrupt over a very narrow interval of time, indicative of most likely behavior change, although we can't say for sure. But it's not consistent. This is not consistent with herd immunity. So Dean has introduced a breakpoint here, and the the transmission before that point was quite high, typical of you know the Omicron values that we were um, we were worried about in early December based on reports from uh, South Africa. Um, but then here it's it's he's had to drop it down by quite a large factor over 10% in order to fit the data um, properly. So a similar type of analysis can be done in some of the other Canadian provinces. We see here Alberta and Manitoba. So again, in, in these provinces, because of testing capacity limits, Dean is using 
the hospital admissions data, which is more reliable. And so Dean's fitting the model to this admissions data. And from that admissions data is uh, estimating hospital occupancy or fitting hospital occupancy and ICU occupancy and projecting that forward. And what you can see from his, um, his predictions here that in Alberta, they're around their peak uh, well, maybe they're just past their peak or right at their peak right now in terms of hospital admissions and uh, maybe a little bit before their peak um, in, uh, in hospital occupancy. Uh, in Manitoba, you're seeing something, again, similar, which is getting near or just past a peak in uh, hospital occupancy and past the peak already in, um, in the admissions. Now in BC, uh, just take a look at the quality of this data here. Uh, in particular, how wide the noise is on it compared to what we're seeing here. And so what that means is that um, it's very difficult to fit this accurately. And so um, so we now have poor case data because of testing capacity limits. And the hospital admissions data is uh, suffers from its high variance, um, you know, partly because hospital admission data are posted irregularly and um, there's been changes in the, um, the reporting protocol. So it's, uh, it's not a great data set for using for, um, for model fitting. What you can see just from the hospital occupancy data is that there's still a rise, but it seems to be slowing. So that's indicative of being close perhaps to a turnaround, although we're not seeing that turnaround yet in the hospital occupancy or ICU occupancy. Okay, so uh, here's a model from the uh, SFU Magpie group. Um, that's from Carolyn Collines. Uh, group. So this is a multivariant. So we have uh, Delta here, Delta infections in blue and Omicron infections in red. And it uh, includes vaccination. So susceptibles, unvaccinated, vaccinated, and uh, with boosters. And, um, and the way they are fitting the data. So there's a description down here, but I'll flip to show you. Uh, so this is the overall case counts, but they're not fitting to those case counts. They're fitting to a corrected version of the case counts based on the 70 plus data. And um, here you see the time course of infections rather than the case counts, which are kind of falling below what's going on with infections. You can see that there's um, still using this change in transmission, which you know brought down our spread rate uh, in the end of December. You can see that there's a uh, continued climbing throughout January and the infections peak here in the model um, somewhere around this week or next week, somewhere early in February. But you'll notice that the uncertainty bands here are quite large, meaning that this curve could be correct here, but it could also be, you know, any one of a number of curves that all fit into the same region. So uh, high uncertainty, considerable uncertainty about the peak size and timing. And this is an update for uh, from Sally Otto's age-based model that I went through in the last report. This is just the hospitalization data. And what you're seeing here is, um, is that the number of individuals in hospital, which is the dots here, are lying on what we sort of projected or assumed to be the range of severity. So if the dots were lying right on the light green, that would be consistent with a low end estimate of 30%, 33% severity from, from one report from the UK, or the higher end here from uh, Ferguson et al, which is uh, suggestive of a higher severity. And you can see that it's kind of hugging the low end of that. And again, um, the uh, the peak looks like it's still ahead of us, but again, there's uncertainty in here underlying this data is, or this, um, this model fitting is the 70 plus data as well. So vaccination status in, uh, by age, you can see we've got um, a very slow progress in first and second doses, which is the first doses are the red and second doses, the green. Um, and so, and in blue, you can see the boosters. So the boosting is now moving along still pretty quickly with in the last week, about five and a half percent of the population has been recently boosted. You can see the older ages here have made it quite a oh, far way around 
the circle and uh, younger age groups are making their way around pretty quickly compared to what's happening with vaccination first and second time around. So the booster shot progress, just to give you a sense of how well it's doing, this black line up here was um, was the uh, the goal for boosters, 70,000 70, per day. And you can see that we've fallen somewhat short of that, you know, down at 20,000 per day early on in December. That came up to a peak, uh, you know, getting close to 60,000 per day, but that seems to be tapering off now. So just to decipher the data here, the blue bars are over weekends or holidays where the reporting only comes in at the end and it's an average over that um, period. And the red dots are the daily reports. So this slide on changing immunity with Omicron uh, is pretty much what it was on our last report. You can see that the risk, the relative risk of infection for unvaccinated to vaccinated was about a factor of nine, meaning that a vaccinated individual was one ninth as likely to get infected. That dropped down because of uh, Omicron, Omicron's ability to um, avoid the benefits of vaccination to avoid the immune response of unvaccinated individuals to some extent, but there's still a slight benefit and it's close to one and a half or two percent, uh, sorry, a factor of one and a half to two protection from vaccination from infection. However, for hospitalization, it still remains relatively high. So it was a factor of over 20 uh, difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And with Omicron, that's dropped down to wide air bands here, but somewhere in the range of a factor of 10 um, uh, protection for vaccinated individuals in relative to unvaccinated. That's for hospitalization. So sources of uncertainty, lots of them. The first thing is a fraction of infections that have been tested reported in the past. So just how much immunity exists within the population. Um, the changing age distribution of infections are more of the 70 plus sick now, or did they have higher, relatively higher case counts earlier in the Omicron wave? That's unknown. Uh, we have kids are now back in person at school for a few weeks, and number of universities recently just went back in person, and some, uh, for example, my own UBC is going back in person on Monday. So we don't know yet what the impact of that will be on, on spread and case counts, or on, I should say, infections. Um, variation among regions. Some health authorities got hit with Omicron earlier, some later. Um, not clear how that's playing into um, how the numbers are, are rolling out. Um, it's unclear how long infections last for people with uh, Omicron and maybe with BA2, that's different from BA1, we don't know. All sorts of questions about that still. Um, so we, we don't know um, what the protection is like for reinfection. Um, and we really don't know the impact of BA2, including whether BA2's growth advantage results from increased transmissibility. And, uh, and we don't know what its rate of spread will be in BC or if the Omicron wave going on currently will afford us some level of protection against it. So moving forward, how can we reduce the uncertainty and improve surveillance of COVID-19? So here's just a comparison uh, to what's done for other respiratory viruses. So uh, influenza-like illness and lab-confirmed infections are monitored across Canada currently and have been for a while. So this is done through a network of hospitals, labs, doctor's offices, and provincial health ministries. There is something called Flu Watchers, which is a volunteer network that report their own symptoms. And this allows um, for a, a sort of background monitoring of what's going on with the flu or whatever, um, whatever is causing similar type symptoms. Um, so there's analysis of severe disease outcomes and flu strain characterization, uh, including monitoring for drug, drug resistance and uh, monitoring of vaccination levels as well. And then re weekly reports are produced by PHAC at the national level and the BCCDC locally here in the province. Just a couple of summary words here. Influenza monitoring benefits from consistent data collection and case characterization, uh, although even there, data accessibility remains an issue. Okay, implications for reporting on SARS-CoV-2, the virus that uh, causes COVID-19. So BC has already transitioned away from testing most symptomatic people 
Um, this changes the data that's available and makes modeling more uncertain. Routine surveillance and consistent reporting, like what I described on the previous page, could be very useful for keeping track of what's going on with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, hospital admissions data. In the absence of uh, reliable case data, hospital admissions data is pretty much almost as good um, as long as it's reported in a timely and consistent fashion and uh, and updated as case information becomes available. So there's, you know, backdating information is not always uh, made available in a, in a convenient form. Uh, so this would provide a reliable data stream for projection. Um, so rates of SARS-CoV-2 infection, especially in infants and kids, uh, should be presented alongside other respiratory viruses. So another method for you know keeping track of what's going on would be an ongoing study of a cohort of people who undergo regular testing, uh, regardless of whether they're symptomatic or not. Um, and that would give detailed and consistent information about current rates of infection in different age groups. So this um, this could be done, let's say, across the the province. There's you know precedent for this being done done being done elsewhere. Um, this would this would actually be more than the current strategy for influenza. Okay, so uh, the key messages from our report on the state of the Omicron wave in BC. So uh, cases in individuals over 70 in age, they've plateaued, and there's some evidence of decline, at least in the Fraser Health, not yet elsewhere. Um, until cases in this age group drop, more broadly, hospital demand is not predicted to drop, right? That would be an indicator. Uh, as long as the people who are mostly ending up in the hospital are still getting sick, that's going to keep the hospital demand high. Um, so in general, the hospital burden in BC has remained relatively low. And what I mean by low is, uh, is much lower than worst case scenarios considered in previous reports. So the reason for this is largely due to individual behavior change. Um, possibly booster program um, with you know 50% of adults now having received a booster and the low severity of Omicron being on the lower end of what we anticipated. Right now we may be at the peak number of Omicron infections but there's substantial uncertainty in that claim due to gaps in all potential data sources that we have or would like to use for um, for for uh, projection, including hospitalizations, wastewater surveys, and genomic data. So final message here, and I'll just read this because um, I wanna make sure I get it all in here. So accurate, timely, and consistent data is needed to understand the progress of the pandemic and the impacts of public health measures. Sharing high quality and anonymized data with the public can build trust uh, and supports a less polarized discussion around policy. High quality data should be consistent and timely and may include hospital admissions, monitoring cohorts for asymptomatic and symptomatic disease, wastewater surveillance, and genomic surveillance of variants. Such consistent data streams help support projections and decision making. So our group will continue to call for sharing of anonymized public health data for SARS-CoV-2, as well as other infections, non-infectious, environmental and mental health conditions. That is our report for February 4th, 2022. I hope you keep well, and uh, we will be back with another report in a few weeks.